Okay. Let's put it in a logical way. There you go. Are you ready? Yep. So, we're going to turn over to the New Testament now. And there's some scriptures we're going to find there. Everybody goes, oh, there are no queer people in the New Testament. Oh, yes, there are. <laughs> yes, there are. And guess what? They're good people. Mm -hmm. Not bad people. So let's look, at, let's look at scripture in Matthew, chapter 19. Now let me preface this by saying this. I think Jesus was a smart guy. Right? I think Jesus was the Son of God. And I think that by virtue of being the Son of God, you kind of get some smarts that other people don't have, perhaps, right? And maybe he's omniscient, just like God is. So I think when he talks about people, he probably knows what he's talking about. Now, if I believe that, then I need to read chapter... 19 in the, in the book of Matthew, and we will read verses 11 through 12. Jesus is talking to this group, and they're, they're arguing about relationships and divorce and marriage and stuff, right? So we have the context there of intimate relationships. And Jesus says, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others were made that way by people. And others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Now here's the thing. Eunuchs, there's this, there's this sort of broad concept that people have because it's not something we talk about a lot anymore. But there's a sort of broad context that people have their castrated males who were then heads of household because they were safe. It's safe to leave them with a wife because they're not much, that much now, which is actually not true, but whatever. Right? <laughs> But eunuch also denoted gay males sometimes. Now, is Jesus smart enough to know that? I think so, <laughs> in any language, right? So Jesus is saying not everybody's going to get this, right? So the thing is, if you're straight and you have no association at all with same-sex people, don't worry about it. You know, don't don't freak out about it. Don't even worry about it. It's not for you. But some people need to hear this word, and that's what Jesus is telling us. Not everyone can accept this, but only those for whom it has been given. There is a message here for us today. And that is that some people are born the way that I wanted them to be. And that is units. And sometimes that means they're gay. And sometimes there are people, there are a class of people who have been made eunuchs by people, whether that's castration or whatever, right? And some people have chosen this life of dedication to the kingdom of God and denounced marriage and done these other things, okay? So there are different contexts for eunuch there. But Jesus certainly knew that some of the people that he was talking about were same-sex attracted. And I won't use the word gay necessarily because, again, we didn't have a concept of gay identity. But there were certainly what we would label as that in our context today. Jesus is smart enough to know that. And does he condemn those people? Is that what he's doing in this passage? Absolutely not. In fact, some of them have dedicated themselves to the kingdom of heaven. For those to whom this scripture is directed, take it into your heart. And if it's not for you, leave them alone. Okay. So, I do think Jesus is pretty smart. The last passages I want us to talk about today, and there are others we could talk about, but in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, we have a story of Jesus healing a centurion's boy. Now, a centurion is a Roman soldier, and he's over a fairly decent amount of soldiers that are under him, right? So he has some degree of power in the Roman army. So that's who we're talking about here, okay? So... Jesus has been talking to the disciples and, and the people, and he's been giving the parables and talking about them. And that time period has come to an end, right? And he's entered into Capernaum, which is a city, and that's where this guy is that we're going to talk about here. So let's read Luke 7, 1 through 10. When Jesus had finished saying all of this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, 
for I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and your servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such faith, even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Now, there's a brief reference to the same story in Matthew as well. And here's the interesting thing about comparing these versions. Okay, Luke is Greek. He's writing in Greek. He's a Greek physician, or at least the servant to one. We're not clear exactly, right? But he certainly called that the Greek physician. And he's writing in that language. And the word that he uses in this passage that the centurion is telling Jesus, you know, this is, this is somebody who's important to me, is paeus, P-A-I-S, in the, the Greek English translation of that, okay? And that often was used in that time in Greek to denote a same-sex partner, okay? And often that relationship was between an older man and a younger man because that was sort of the model, right? Now, people get hung up, oh, well, he must have just been a regular servant because the centurion owns him, sort of, right? Well, here's the thing. How did a straight guy get, and again, straight didn't exist either, don't get that confused, but how did a guy who wanted a wife get it, get his wife? Anybody know? He bought her. He bought her. So to argue that this can't be his male lover because he bought him, no. <laughs> that makes no sense. Because that's how that worked, okay? So for a man to have bought a younger male as a lover is not only not unheard of, it was actually fairly common, okay? We didn't have the words for that case, right? So when we compare that, though, to Matthew's account of the story, we find an even stronger argument for it. Because the centurion, when he's telling Jesus, you know, I get what it's like, don't bother yourself coming here, you have servants and you tell them to go do this and do that, I get the same thing. I have servants, so I tell them to go. Well, when the centurion is talking about the servants that he has authority over, he uses a different word, tulos, to connote your average servant. But the word that he uses for the boy who is ill, that he loves and wants healed, remains pace. So the centurion has made even clearer through his own language, you need to know who you're healing here. Does Jesus blink an eye at the possibility that he is healing a gay male in our context, same-sex lover? Does he blink an eye? No, not only does he not blink an eye, he says about the centurion that he's amazed because he hasn't found such great faith as this guy has, even in all of Israel. Not only is he not condemning this centurion and his relationship with this pious, not only is he not condemning it, <clears throat> he takes it in stride and praises the man for his faith. Okay? Now here's the thing. Can we make scripture say things that we want it to say? Sure. Think about it. But here's, here's the thing about scripture. God gives us this, and I do believe this is the Word of God, okay? I don't believe, I'm not a fundamentalist, I don't believe that every word in it is literal, because that would make no sense. <laughs> it really wouldn't. There are too many places where it doesn't agree with itself. And there are too many places where we get poetry about the, the mountains which rose and clapped, right? It did not happen literally, you can't make that happen, right? Can we bring our own biases to it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is why we have scholarship. Which is why I compare Matthew and Luke. Right? So that we can see what it really says. And here's the bottom line for the scripture. For any of these scriptures. This book, which is holy, I believe, which is the word of God for us, I believe, is all intended from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. Everything in here is designed to bring us into relationship with God. To reveal to us God's love for us. 
that is so amazing that even through all the trials that God goes through with the Israelites in the Old Testament, I'm like, God, I would have given up. Really? Because <laughs> the Israelites keep being faithful, and then they walk away. And they're faithful, and they walk away. And God hangs in there with them through everything. And then God says, they are so not getting this. I'm going to have to go down there. And God sends Jesus, God in the flesh, God's only son, to us to say, it's about love. It's about loving God and loving your neighbor. And if you get those two things, Jesus says, you get the rest of it. Well, guess what? One of your neighbors might be gay. One of your neighbors might be a eunuch. One of your neighbors might be a centurion who has a same-sex lover. Love them. Because here's what happens when we open the door to love. And then you read the scripture, then you're reading it with the Holy Spirit. Because that's what the Holy Spirit is. Right? God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Trinity. God is love. God is perfect love, according to the scripture. And when we read scripture with God and God's point of view, then we love people. We don't condemn people. We don't judge people. We don't hate people. That's not of God. And it helps us to come to the scripture with new eyes. You know, one of the fascinating things, one of the things I love about the scripture is that it's like this onion. There's always these different layers. And I come to it as a 12-year-old and I read one thing. And I come to it as a 20-year-old and it's the same book, but I find something totally different with it. And I come to it as a parent and as a spouse and all of these different things that I become. And I read it differently. Not a word has changed, but it's a different book for me because it's alive. And when I put on God's love and God's eyes, and I come and I read the scripture and I see the stories, it's in a whole new light. And the book has never changed. But suddenly I see, wow, my story is in there too. I know what love at our sight is like. I know what it is to love somebody so much that if I had a kingdom, I would give it up for them. Yeah. That's what Jonathan and David were like. How cool is that that this massively awesome love story between two guys is in Samuel? How cool is it that these all these cool models of family are praised and honored in the scripture? How cool is it that this guy who has bought this young boy, because that's what you did, right? And he loves him tremendously. Reaches out to Jesus, even though know, this guy's a Roman soldier. So this is a really big deal on many levels that he does this. Reaches out to Jesus and says, I believe you can heal him. If you just say the word, you're going to have to come here. I'm not even worthy for you to be under my roof. But I love this guy. And all of a sudden we see ourselves in the scripture. And isn't that what love is? Seeing ourselves in each other's stories. And God gives us the start right here and says, look at the stories. They're you. You're in there. And sometimes you're ornery. That's in there too. And sometimes you're wonderful and that's in there too. And sometimes you have struggles with the relationships and that's in there too. And sometimes your relationships that are different than the world says is okay are honored and that's in there too. God's amazing. God's word is amazing. And I think it's so cool that we're in there too. And we're celebrated in there too.